Wait, I yeah. think that's oh, we're recording. It. I think yeah, that's it. It says we're recording. <laughs> cool. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just here with Simon and we are um, just having a quick chat on Zoom about what God's doing and stuff like. So, so you guys have been up in up in the northwest for a while and stuff and um but your story starts a long way before then because we met up in in london back in yes. back in the day so um um January i remember 1999 well that goes back a while isn't it like so um you you pitched up and originally in croydon in a church or something didn't you what happened there i did i was um i was actually a paranoid wreck I was uh, had a pretty horrific childhood, and then uh, I'd, I'd gone into every type of drug, you know, so weed, speed, and crack cocaine and ketamine. And then the crack cocaine, I'd ended up paranoid, and so I got to the point where where if I tried to sleep, actually, I'd put my head on the pillow and I'd hear footsteps inside my flat walking around. And then as I started to end sleep, they'd come and whisper to me and tell me how they were going to kill me. And these these evil spirits would would torment me day and night. And so I got to a point where I had to drink and had to take drugs and had to do do something to try and silence them. And uh, before oh. I met God, God, that's where I was. I was in a place of terror. And uh, I was, if I went from one room of my house to another room of my house, I would take a weapon with me. You know, if, the, if, the, if, if the postman came, I'd go with a knife or, a, or an air gun or anything I could because somebody was out to kill me all the time because day and night I was hearing these voices and uh, hearing their footsteps and hearing their, their threats you know they were audible and uh so so then my dad called and invited me to church and i went i went along to church was paranoid of everybody everybody that was out to kill me as far as i was concerned and uh you know i lived in terror that was that was my reality i lived in terror and if you live in terror you you sometimes attack people <laughs> because you think they're going to kill you and you've got to kill them first so so i hurt people you know i i attack people who are innocent you know and and uh, I stole from people to, to to get drugs and to to get drink, so it was a mess. And then uh, I walked into this church, and uh, the, the the tangible manifest presence of God came into the church, and this this invisible, powerful presence came into the room, and it was terrifying. And I knew as as he moved around the building, he he went near people. I I, I felt this presence. You know, going near people. As he went near people, they began to shake or weep or cry or laugh, and uh, some of them just looked visibly peaceful. And the the presence moved around this church building. As it came near me, I knew if he touched me, I, I would be undone. I'd be I'd be a wreck, and I'd be crying. And so I I ran out of the church, and uh, it wasn't until I got outside the church I realized that. I have never experienced anyone who loves so much and I haven't yet experienced him. And I've never felt such power as I felt in that presence that had come into the room. And that I didn't know at the time that was the presence of the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I quickly said to my dad, you know, that, that, is there another meeting? You know, I need to get back in there. And they'd lock the doors, you see, because it was lunchtime. And, and uh, my dad said, there's a meeting tonight. So I went along to this meeting and I, I was, I'm still this this paranoid, terrified wreck. So every time somebody smiles at me, I think that they're you know they, they've got a weapon. They're going to get me soon. They're, you know somebody must be about to attack me. And uh, the uh, the worship started. You know, and it was a more, it was like a normal church service. You know, so that the chair and they, they start to worship him. And I feel something on the inside of me. Just you know, you've got to worship him. Something about the holiness of God came into the room that he was worthy. And even though I didn't believe in God, this, <laughs> this, this conflicting thing was happening. And, uh, and then the, the lady at the front of the church, she, she stood up and she, she pointed across the room at me. And I noticed she was shaking. And she, she said, God sent his son to die for your sins. And, and he's given his life for you. And what are you going to do about that? And as she was speaking, my, my feet began to shake. And I I, I looked down, I was confused. I thought, you know, what's going on? And this, this power hit me and it, it ran up my whole body. My whole body started to shake uncontrollably. And uh, the, the fear of the Lord came upon me. And uh, God then, it, you know, I'm not saying I saw God because, you know, no, no man shall see God and live, it says. But 
but it was like God had put his face right next to mine, a bit like a dad would, would if he takes his son aside to have a word with him, you know, and the face of God was next to my face, and he said, what, what have you done? You know, Jesus died for your sins. What are you going to do about it? Yes or no? Choose me now or choose death. And uh, I said yes, and suddenly the love of God hit me in the chest like a grenade. <laughs> and uh, my body was thrown through three rows of chairs, and I landed on the floor just overwhelmed by the love of God. Now, the, 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 kind, of, the kind of fruit in this is I, I went back to my flat. Now, I said I was paranoid, but my front door I had two huge bolts on the door, and I had an alarm on the door, and I had chains on the door. And it was like getting in and out of Fort Knox every time I walked into a house. So as I got to my house, you know, full of the presence of God and, and a changed man, you know, just Jesus is real. God is real. It's a completely different world has opened up to me. And I unlocked all the chains and the doors and got in. And I walked into my house expecting this. Time. The presence of Jesus had taken over my flat. And I walked into the room. It was full of peace. And, you know, the, the word says, when, when you sleep, you know, great will be your peace. You know, because he, he who watches over you neither slumbers nor sleeps. And I slept for the first time in years, you know, peacefully. And, and the enemy had been chased out of my life. And uh, he, he, he began from that day to completely change everything. I mean, radically change the way I see the world. And, you know, hearing his voice became a normal thing. You know, I'm going to send you to the nations. And next thing I'm preaching in Russia and preaching in America. And, you know, and, and he, this is all very hyper and dramatic, but he loves to dwell in the normal. You know, in, you know, you go to work and he wants to be present in your day-to-day -day work when the kids are stressing you out when, and so I can talk a lot, but you know, he, he, loves, he loves us with such a great love that he, he wants to be present when, when the bill comes through the door and we get stressed. You know, he, he wants us to be aware of him at every given moment. And when, when trouble comes, you know, he, he wants us to be aware. And when, when somebody comes to us with a need, he wants to be in our ear giving us the answer, you know. And so, so that's what life is. Life is challenges, but, but experiencing God come alongside and speak into people's lives. And it's my, it's my joy because the, the one who saved me is saving people. And it's, change, you know, this, um, this last weekend I had a, I had a dream. And uh, in the dream, it was it was it was my pastor's wife, uh, and my pastor's di died since then. But he's gone upstairs, and uh, my pastor's wife. And in the dream, she she was she was thinking of writing a book. She was thinking of, you know, she had this creativity about her, and she 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 was being she'd gone to some Christians, and they had, they had criticized her, and, and said, "Now this isn't from God." And in the dream, she was in she was in an old library. And, she got a pen and the whole night she she wrote all over the walls of the library the things god was telling her all about the lord what he's been showing her and uh, in the morning the christians came back and they criticized her as if she was a crazy old lady and uh, so i called her and i i thought you know this could be me this could be a a, a dream that i've imagined this uh, this could be god and i mm. called her and, and she asked she said oh what's happening i said god has given me a dream and i just wanted to share that and she 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 said you know I've written this book and God's told me to get it published and I've, I've gone to some Christians around me and I've asked them to read it and they have come back and criticized me. She said, this morning I, I was desperate and I said to God, you know, if you don't want me to publish this book, I'll forget all about it. I'll put it away. But if it's of you, send someone to tell me, you know, and my delight is, that, isn't, you know, why does he choose me to share and the same you know thing is he wants to choose all of us to share he wants all, all of us to to be able to hear him um his word mm -hmm. says is, is people will be volunteers in the day of his power you know, he wants a volunteer heart and that's what it, it means any of us can be used you know paul said i was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling and my speech and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words but but with a demonstration of god's spirit and his power so he wants our weakness you know he wants us weak people so he can he can splash his love over the world, and over the lost, and over the broken, and over the needy. So you got me talking. <laughs> mm. so. No, that's so so encouraging because um, I was with some been with some guys just recently quite a lot, and uh, they're really kind of like totally very very keen, quite on fire. And some of them are some of them being a Christian like a few years, some just like about a year or two or, or about two years. 
and um, and their their lives have been radically changed. They've had ups and downs, but they you know like they, they've got that passion. It was just really challenged me actually because of course you come from fairly you know normal or not particularly dramatic background, but yeah. but I, I I'm always challenged by people who who've had like a massive turnaround and stuff. And then we 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 met. Uh, gosh, that was quite some time ago, wasn't it? And Oasis yeah. trip. So yeah. And um and uh and I think what I what I really love about your story is how I like and it's really really good reconnecting of it again because um. I kind of like, I remember the times which were really tough for you when you're going through a really, oh, yeah. really bad patch. And um, where, you know, you we went through a lot of stuff on a personal level that was really hard. Um, and and how God took you through that. And, um, and you know, even when it looked very, very bleak and stuff. So uh, is there anything you want to say about how God kind of takes us through the rough patches and yet, you know, like he really does turn up in the middle of all that and beyond and, you know uh, that's really shows me what that's what's brilliant isn't it because he, he you know i see the supernatural once once a month you know something that you know i'm aware of god's presence but something that shows me he, he's in it for the people around me you know he he has a heart for those who are, who are around us so you know you can you can misunderstand and think there's these spiritual giants walking around there isn't there you know, even Paul was really clear. You know, he, he was with, with with him in weakness and fear. You know, he 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 was a, a broken man. You know, in Asia, he despaired even of life. You know, <laughs> you know, it was such such a burden in Asia that he he was depressed. You know, and uh, that's a, that's a brilliant thing that he could be. I mean, you're talking about you know when my kidneys failed and I was I was in the I was in the peak of ministry. If you like, I was traveling around the world and I was I was praying for the sick and seeing them healed, and it was all so dramatic you know such such a lot of i guess dynamic ministry where we'd see god impact people mm -hmm. and uh it's good <laughs> and uh you know then i then i was I, I had a month of meetings planned and, and my my kidneys failed and i got to the you know i i was so sick that i couldn't hold down any food you know i was getting cramps all over my body i was i was sweating profusely i was just constant nausea and uh even so, even so, I was going to preach at, at churches, you know, like that. Even we saw miracles, mm. <laughs> you know. While I was sick, we prayed for the sick and saw them healed, you know. So it was a strange dynamic, you know. And uh, then when my when my, my kidneys failed, really, I, I I'd gone for a blood test and I got a I got home to try and eat some dinner, and I got a phone call from from the hospital saying, basically, come in now, you're dying. And uh, this is. You know the way God works is just fantastic because He's got people everywhere. Mm. So, I, so I went to the hospital and they, they, the doctor looked at me and looked at my blood results and said, "I'm, I'm surprised you're even standing in front of me. You know, mm. your kidneys have failed. You, I'm not sure if you'll last the night. You know, your, your blood levels are so bad. We don't think you're going to survive this." So, me and my my wife are, are cr I'm crying, <laughs> and. Uh, took me down to A&E &E and, and put me on a drip and then moved me into a side room. And uh, they said, said, oh, we're going to transfer you to a specialist hospital and we want you to stay in the side room. And, you know, we're going to keep you on a drip and keep an eye on you. And this, this negativity, this depression, this fear came over me because my life is at an end. You know, I was, I was 20, 23 years old. And uh, we, were, we were just married. You know, me and my wife were just married. It was our first anniversary you know the mm. the day after basically so uh you know when when trouble strikes it doesn't always strike <laughs> when we're feeling strong when we're and uh it can be a chat so so anyway i'm sat there and i'm kind of thinking, you know god where are you in this and this thing that this african nurse came in and she looked at me and she said she said son this is the word of the lord for you you shall not die but live and declare the word of the lord wow, wow. you know and God has people everywhere. And, you know, like I'm, I'm speaking earlier, that God wants to volunteer hearts who are ready to speak his word for him. He's not mm. looking for, you know, there, there was, recently during the COVID thing, there was, a, there was a story about a cleaner, you know, who, who had access to a guy who had COVID and the, the mm. cleaner got in and was able to pray for him and see him healed. Mm. <laughs> you know, God, God wants a volunteer heart. He doesn't look, he doesn't see position. He doesn't see stature. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't actually want mighty men of God. I've got some some friends, and their culture is always to call 
call me man of God, but no, he he's, he calls children of God. You know, as many as believe in his name to them, gives he the right to become children of God. It's not a brilliant, you know, such a blessing that we can, uh, we can, so, so anyway, so this, then I, I was transferred to the other hospital and plugged into a dialysis machine. And I spent the next probably three and a half years um, going to dialysis every week, you know, and three times a week plugged into a machine. And, uh, you know, at, at the beginning, my, my faith was courageous. I, I, the doctors would come along and they'd say, you know, this is your reality until you have a transplant. I'd say, I'm not having a transplant. God will heal me. You know, he's faithful and he'll look after me. And it, it was really a time to challenge my faith because I was always busy. You know, I was always trying and always serving the Lord. Mm. And uh, it's brilliant because on where the bit of the word is. Um, it, I, I took this bit from the word and it says that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he will also give you life to your mortal body, your, your now flesh body through the spirit who lives in you. And I, I constantly pondered this, you know, actually he's promised he will give life to my now body. You know, and the action set coming and telling me off, you know, this is, this is because of your sin. This is because it's a judgment from God. This is because you have fallen short. This is, you know, you're not fasting enough. You're not praying enough. You're not drinking enough. You, you drink the wrong herbal tea. You know, <laughs> anything you can imagine. They, they <laughs> literally came up. You know. I've heard this, there's this magic tea out there, clears kidney failure, you know, drink plenty of it. Um, you know, <laughs> so it was a challenging time. And uh, you actually were, you came along to me for a cup of tea at one point, a couple of times. And, uh, you did what Jesus would do sometimes. Sometimes he doesn't want us to be spiritual. Sometimes he wants us to, to be there and just listen and just drink a cup of tea with somebody, just be normal. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, was, it was healing, actually, at the time, um, massively so, because I was surrounded by lots of Christians with lots of advice, and I needed someone to come in and be Jesus at that time. You were. And, uh, but, you know, so, so, so it was a strange time, you know, Three and a half years of this, I, I had no energy. I couldn't brush my own hair. I had to get my hair cut short because, you know, I used to have long hair and I had to get it sh shut and cut short because I couldn't brush my own hair. I couldn't hold a ha hairbrush. I couldn't hold my own Bible. You know, I was so weak. And, uh, and there, you know, I could, I could talk for the whole evening, you realize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> your evening may be gone. Um, but, you know, his faithfulness and... Uh, I had this, eventually I got plugged into this, uh, this home dialysis system. So I could, I could stay at home and at nighttime they plugged me into this machine and it was brilliant because most of my day was then free. I didn't have to go to the hospital three times a week. And, uh, but every night I would lean in the wrong position and, and the alarm would go off on the machine and it would wake me up. Hmm. And, uh, there's a to me, period. If you look at the prophets in the Old Testament and look at look at the people in the Bible, you realize there's long periods of drought where they don't hear the voice of the Lord, they don't hear God's word, they they are struggling. And uh, I felt like I was in that. You know, God wasn't instantly healing me; He wasn't answering me. It felt like, you know, what's happened? Did I do something wrong in ministry that you <laughs> this has happened? And then the the voices of Christians weren't encouraging. And uh, anyway, one night I was really fed up actually, and I'd rolled over, and the alarm had gone off again. And in my heart was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just like G Jesus said, you know, Eloi, Eloi, let's let myself work funny. My God, my God, my, why have you forsaken me? And as I, as I heard that in my heart, you know, I'm probably five in the morning, I'm barely woken up. The, the Lord said, no, no, no. I was forsaken that you would be embraced. You know, my son, <laughs> he was forsaken that you would be embraced. And for you, it's not my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But my God, my God, how you've embraced me. And uh, the, the embrace of God came upon me and uh, the, the, the overflowing love of God came upon me. And uh, I was broken, actually, because I, I, I couldn't do anything to serve the Lord. I had nothing left. And yet he was pouring his love on me. And it's, you know, something he wants. That I, I'm, I'm in the church now on the leadership and the people are busy. People are always busy trying to do, trying to plan, trying to organize, trying to be good Christians trying to reach out, trying to run a food bank, trying to find a way to do something. 
and they, they haven't learned you know people haven't learned to just drink just to receive from the lord just to still in quietness or and realize that actually they're not accepted because they're good or because they're a good christian or because they're good in ministry they're they're accepted because blood was shed mm-hmm. you know and i came into this wonderful time of realizing and, and walking actually a, a, a new level of power because when when i went to pray for people wouldn't sitting out because actually he loves you so much that he wants to pour out his blessing on you and i can just sit back and let him do that because he wants to you know and instead of me trying to trying to stir anything up actually you know he loves with such a passion that he wants to bless you and he wants to pour out his love upon you and actually the holy spirit wants to manifest jesus to you in your dreams and in your in, in your waking hours he wants to come and manifest jesus to you so he can manifest to those around you so um so yeah it was a challenging time and it ended up i you know for three years i I'd, I'd refused to go on a transplant waiting list um because i wanted a miracle and and uh but it got to the point where my wife was struggling i was getting sick so often um and i was sometimes so close to death that you know it, it was having a having a you know, it was burdening my wife and she she was in, I, I found her in tears one time and I said, you know, I'm going to go and get on that transplant list and just, I'm going to give it to God. And if they call me and offer me a transplant, if the Holy Spirit says no at that moment, I'll stay on dialysis and wait for the miracle. But if when they call me and offer me a, a, a transplant, you know, he says, yes, I'll go with it. And uh, so I went on a transplant list. I was on it for six months and, and my wife had gone away on holiday for the first time in four, you know, almost four years of caring for me. And she'd finally gone off to have a break that she was, you know, well deserved a break that, you know, and, uh, I got the call and the Holy Spirit said, go for it. And, uh, my, my transplant, my blood levels are, are, are improving year by year. So instead of the levels going down over time, my, my kidney has more life and more function in it. It's never had any rejection. It, it is blessed. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, you know, so, so it's, um, yeah so he's faithful in all of his ways you know he really is he's absolutely faithful and you know he's with, with us as christians as we we don't try him on that we don't lean in to see his faithfulness we we deal with our struggles on our own you know we 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 try and resolve our own problems you know last uh was it, i think it was last year and uh we were driving down a country road with the kids and having a lovely day it was sunshine it was yorkshire over these bumpy hills and uh, the car died and uh, really died. And we, we, you know, our, we can have a human reaction. So we should be freaking out. The car's died. What are we going to do? And, uh, but, you know, instead I just said, you know, God, you've got this, you know, sometimes we're not tuned in, but I was tuned in. I said, you know, God, you've got this. You've never let us down before. There's no reason to believe you're going to let us down in this. So we had a picnic with the kids while we waited for the breakdown company. And uh, they got us home, and then the next morning at ten o'clock, we we got a phone call from the from the garage because they didn't, they had the car, and they said it's scrap. You need to get rid of it. Well, with four kids, that's not ideal, you know. And so me and Emma, we started talking about maybe if we cut down money here or we cut down money there, we could eventually in the next four months be able to afford a car. Maybe six months if we really, <laughs> you know, if we cut down, we might be able to afford a car. We can cut down our food budget and cut down our. And that's what I mean. God wants to be involved in the normal things of life, you know. He really does. And uh, so this is this is ten o'clock. We're pondering this, and I, I suddenly had it in my heart, you know, I just spoke what I had, which sounded like craziness. And I said, God wants better for us than that. God loves us more than that than to leave us waiting for three months and scraping and saving. God wants more than that. And as I said, it the phone rang, and I answered the phone. It was somebody offering to buy us a new car. And uh, so, so we had found out, you know, 10 o'clock that our car was dead. And by 10.01, we had a new one. And uh, this is the faithfulness of God. And, he, you know, he says, ask that you may receive that your joy may be full. And we have a problem with ourselves. And, you know, the, the word doesn't say the father is, is compelled and bullied into giving good gifts to his children. But it says the father loves to give good gifts to his children. He delights to. He wants to. He's desperate mm-hmm. to make himself known in his kindness to us. And we are so busy fixing it ourselves that you know, he's got a desperation about him that he wants us to know his love and 
we won't do it if we keep fixing it ourselves. So uh, I, I don't know where the message is, <laughs> but he's desperate, you know. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely awesome. That's so awesome. And um, and what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to I'm just going to sort of finish the first part here, and let, I'm going to see if we can do a a second part as well because there might be some more little <laughs> stories and stuff to, to to come. So.